You're listening to the Vox Media Podcast Network. This is What the Heck with Mike Heck on MMAfighting.com. Now, here is your host, Mike Heck. What the heck? Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome to a brand new edition of What the Heck here on MMAfighting.com. I am Mike Heck. Thank you for checking out the program this week. A lot to get to, as always. A lot of great conversations for your listening and watching pleasure. But before we get into any of that, allow me to reflect, wax poetically for a moment if I could. So today, as this officially drops, it is Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021, which marks exactly one year since I joined the team over at MMA Fighting. One year. And my wife told me this last night. She basically said, you know, tomorrow's one year since you got your new job. And that is freaking insane to me. It really is. Especially thinking back on what has gone on in the world. Like what was going on in the world when this all started. Literally the entire time I was here. I mean, I got a little, I got a little emotional thinking about it because I am a lucky dude. Like I really, really am like coming on right when a pandemic shut down the entire world, all the upcoming cards were getting canceled. And then it was just like a whirlwind from there. Like the UFC was trying to keep UFC 249 in April. Remember that? That was when it was going to be Habib Nurmagomedov versus Tony Ferguson. We were finally going to get it. And then a pandemic struck. Fight was out of Brooklyn. Then they were going to do it at Tachi Palace in California. Remember that whole thing? And then Disney and the governor of California shut it all down. And then it got pushed back like three weeks later in Jacksonville. And then boom, it was just off to the races. Just off to the races. We haven't stopped since. What have we had like three weeks off? Three Saturdays off since then? And those are all made up because we had like two or three weeks where we had like three cards in one week, which is just crazy. It's just been unbelievable. That's why I can't believe it's been a year. It just went by so fast. But I was thinking about it the other day because my wife was like, do you remember the first thing you did with MMA fighting? Like I wrote a couple of articles. I remember Tyson Chartier, who manages and coaches Calvin Cater and Rob Font. He was like my first interview. It wasn't like a video interview, just a regular interview. And we were talking about Tachi Palace and UFC 249 because Calvin Cater was supposed to fight Jeremy Stevens on that card. He ended up fighting him on the new date in May got the finish and it started this crazy year for him. But the first video I did with MMA fighting, it was like upstairs on the third floor in the renovated house that we got it all out. It was my office for the first few months. Now it's like a, it's like a guest room that no one slept in at all, but kind of looked, eh, people kind of gave me crap for it and I get it, but I did what I had to do to get some work done. But I remember it was right after John Jones got arrested for the DWI and the gun charges and You know, it led to this soundbite because I was reading off like fighter tweets that reacting to this and Diego Sanchez said some, said something in his tweet and the soundbite has followed me ever since, but it's been, man, it's been like nonstop working and grinding and hustling and busting my tail, trying to live up to the standards that this website, the readers of this website have expected and I know that there have been a lot of changes over the years. There have been some giant shoes to fill. And I'll be honest, I'll look you right in the face. I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea and that's that's fine. Nobody is. I'm the sit at the bar, talk to you about fighting kind of guy. And that's how I approach the interviews. That's how I approach the shows. I just like to talk with like a game show enthusiasm. You know, like that that's just who I am. And there were some very talented people who used to work here and they were here before me and there's some super talented people that work here now and not easy shoes to fill. But for those who have given me a chance, I truly appreciate it. I am blessed, I'm beyond faith, thankful and uh, to talk to these incredible people, do the show for you, to have between the links, to be able to be a part of onto the next one with AK Lee, my best friend, the preview shows, the post fight shows, the pre fight Q and A's that we just added a few months ago. It's an honor to be a part of that. And I just want to say 
you know, from the bottom of my heart, how much this is all meant to me, how much you all have meant to me in good times and in bad compliments to being called Dana White's nephew or little brother, or son, what have you. It, it's all good. Whatever you have to say, thank you again. Here's to uh, to many more years, one year in the bag, on to year two. That's that. So all the sappy stuff is out of the way. UFC 260 coming up this Saturday, headlined by the heavyweight championship rematch between Stipe Miocic and Francis Ngannou. Huge, huge fight because not only is the heavyweight strap on the line, not only is it a rematch, I was there. One of the first pay-per-view events I ever covered was UFC 220 in Boston at the Garden. That first round between those two guys, insane. Stipe after the fight, refusing to let Dana White wrap the belts around his waist, talking to the media afterwards. John Morgan wasn't there that night. I had the first questions for Stipe Miocic, and I thought the man was going to jump off the stage and punch me in the face. Not just because I had bad questions, because I didn't think they were bad questions, but he was just not in the mood to talk to anybody, and I happened to be the first one, and uh, it was intense. It was an intense moment in my career, but... Heavyweight titles on the line. It's a rematch. A lot of people asking how much has Francis Ngannou improved since that first fight because he's just gone out there and just blasted everybody in the first round. We'll find out, but the title's on the line. The title of baddest man on the planet's on the line. And also, the looming thing, a date with John Jones is also on the line as well because John Jones moving up to heavyweight. He's putting on that size. Dana White has said it many times. The winner of this fight will defend against John Jones later on this year. And I can't wait to see it. I cannot wait to see heavyweight John Jones. The next step towards that happening happens this Saturday. And it is a very fascinating fight, of course. We got some bad news on Saturday. We lost the featherweight title uh, fight, the co-main event between Alexander Volkanovsky and Brian Ortega after the champion Volkanovsky tested positive for COVID-19. They'll rebook it for later in the year. It's unfortunate. I was looking forward to that fight. But hey, still going to be a fun card. We get Tyron Woodley absolutely gigantic fight for him as must win as it gets for the former welterweight champion he's got a tough task ahead of him in vicente luque we have the return of sugar sean o'malley how does he bounce back after his first career loss to cheeto vera he's going to take on thomas almeida we got kama worthy versus jamie malarkey william knight friend of the show been on a few times had some great conversations my back was itchy sorry william knight versus alonzo menafield that rebooking goes down on this card as well there's a lot of good fights on this card should be a good one and we'll be there so get excited for that but uh we're also coming off of ufc vegas 22 Derek brunson gets a big win over kevin holland that's four straight for Derek brunson and here's the thing that kind of irks me about this whole situation because the whole narrative coming out of this fight is kevin holland talked too much a lot of people discrediting kevin holland it's it's the kevin holland show in the loss but not a lot of people are giving credit to Derek brunson why the man is so underappreciated at 185 pounds. And was it the most aesthetically pleasing fight? Was it Rock'em, knock, rock'em Sock'em Robots? That's what it was like, Rock'em Sock'em Robots? No. But he did what he needed to do to win the fight. This is a much different guy than he was three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. He's learned a lot. He's gotten much wiser. That second round where he got dropped or kind of dropped or dropped to a knee, clipped, Three, four years ago, Derek Brunson probably would have got stopped in that moment, but he was able to bounce back, kept his composure, got back to what was winning him the fight. Much wiser. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I hope he gets that fight with Paul Costa that he wants. It makes sense. And he deserves a fight like that after beating Shabazi and after beating Kevin Holland. He deserves that fight. And I hope he gets it. And as far as Kevin Holland goes, I will say I have been trying to get him back on the show. We'll see if we can make that happen this week. We'll see. That's all I can say. I'm working on it. It is what it is, but I think he will. Uh, I think he probably will make that move to 170, unless something pops up quick that he can jump on at 185 just to keep them. You know, just keep fighting. He just wants to fight as often as possible. But the moral of the story, to make a long story short, is give credit where it's due to Derek Brunson. He deserves it. Holland will be back. There you go. We'll be speaking to, in my opinion, the biggest star of that card a little bit later on. In fact, it's going to kick us off. But let's run down the lineup. Let's get to the first guest. I've been yammering long enough, taking strolls down memory lane. You don't want to hear any of that crap. Wrapping us up this week, we're going to speak to Manel Cap. Okay, not Manel Cape. I thought it was Manel Cape. Manel's going to clear that all up. 
at the end of the show. But I will say that the former Ryzen champ, not a happy camper since his most recent fight less than two weeks ago. Lost a split decision to Mateus Nicolau. A fight that everybody, let's be honest, besides Nicolau and probably his coaches and his family and two judges in Las Vegas, thought Manel Cape won. It was a fun fight, but pretty much everybody, like almost unanimously, scored it for Manel Cape. He's unfortunately off to an 0 2 start since signing with the UFC at the beginning of last year. We'll check in with Starboy to wrap up the show this week. Leonard Garcia will join us this week for the first time. He just defeated Joe Elmore in the main event of BKFC 16 this past Friday night and then announced his retirement from combat sports. We'll speak to the former UFC WEC vet, a man that was part of a lot of tremendous battles over the year, Leonard Bad Boy Garcia. Excited to speak with him a little bit later on. Hosting on to the next one, there's one name that keeps coming up anytime we talk about big fights at 145 pounds in the UFC, Josh Emmett. Where is he? When is he coming back? How is he doing after the litany of injuries he suffered in that crazy fight with Shane Burgos last year? We're going to get an update from him in around 20 or so minutes. Kind of a crazy story. You'll hear all that coming up soon. But first, let us check in with the show stealer from this past Saturday at the UFC Apex. 2-0 in the UFC. Now he has two finishes, two bonuses. Adrian Yanez, one of the bright up-and-coming prospects at 135 pounds, kicks us off right now. All right, let us welcome back to the show, in my opinion, the biggest star of this past weekend from UFC Vegas 22. What a performance. Stops Gustavo Lopez in the third round, and now he's hoping to get right back in there May 15th in Houston at UFC 262, right in his backyard. Adrian Giannis joins us, coming off an incredible performance. How are you, man? Man, I'm doing great, man. I, uh, I'm i still on cloud nine from this, man. It was pretty cool, man. I just I just fought a tough opponent and, you know, was able to put a, a really impressive uh, really impressive performance and get in the stoppage, you know? So I'm feeling great. I'm feeling really, really great. Yeah, I mean, it's first of all, it's great to have you here. Congratulations on the win. But, you know, just uh, everything you were just saying, like you were the the freaking bell of the ball, man. I mean, you got the attention of the whole UFC roster. I mean, Teddy Atlas is tweeting about you and and pretty much anybody who's a fan of combat sports. Like, what has that all meant to you? Like, what have the last 48 or or so hours been like for you? Man, honestly, it's, it's just been a lot to take in. Honestly, it's just been a lot, like especially like the Teddy Atlas the Teddy Atlas one was the one that like was getting me choked up, you know, cause you know, me and my dad and my brother and my family, we'd be sitting back watching boxing and we'd hear Teddy Atlas all the time. So, so to me, like getting the praises from Teddy Atlas to me is like, it brought, it brought me back to like a good memory and good memories, you know, cause there's like a family pastime for us to sit down and watch some boxing. So, and we would like just steadily just hear about Teddy Atlas, you know, and, and just seeing his scorecards and everything. So to me that, that like was making me choke up a little. It made me feel really, really good to be like, man, Dad, I got Teddy Atlas commenting on my fight, saying how good of a fight this is. Like I was saying that in my head, and I was like, man, I love this. It's is amazing. So uh, it, it's been cool. It's been it's it's been it's been really nice to get the notoriety from uh, from everybody. So it's it's really cool, man. Uh, and just on top of everything, man, it's like just to go out there and get a great performance like this, man. It's it, it's it's a cherry on top. Yeah, because he wasn't he didn't just give like one tweet. He was like he was like live tweeting the whole fight. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah, so that that was the coolest part. I went back and had a screenshot, screenshot the, the tweet. So I was like, man, I'm keeping this. That's amazing, man. I mean, I, l- we talked after the debut. Obviously, that was memorable for you with the head kick KO in the first round. This one went to the third round. And obvi- like you obviously remember and you always will remember the UFC debut. But considering the opponent, the main card spot, him talking a little bit of greasiness ahead of the fight, the aftermath, the reaction from everybody. Is this win like way sweeter than the debut? Oh, yeah, for me. Absolutely. You know, like uh, no, no disrespect to Victor or anything like that, but. You know, he did take it on a week's notice. And he's not like I'm not I don't want to disparage him and his record or anything like that. But he did come from Alaska and like from the Alaska MMA scene. And and one thing about the about MMA is that the the Alaskan uh, fight com- like the MMA community or like the MMA scene out there, it's not really that big and not really that pre- uh, predominant. And like uh, it's it's one of those that's like kind of like it's 
it's it's it's not the best it's not the best like scene you don't see champions coming out of there uh very much so it's so I, a lot of people can go out there and be like like exactly what gustavo said who is he be everybody's like uh, i think he's the interview they're like yeah like he fought victor rodriguez and he was like who's that and i was like all right you know i don't wanna, i don't ever want to disparage anybody that goes in there because they deserve to be in there uh they're fighters uh, so, you know, just to go in there and fight someone like the stature of Gustavo Lopez, you know, he's coming out the uh, uh, court, uh, Couture, the, the court, uh, man, uh, Extreme Couture gym there in Vegas. So, you know, he was fighting at home. So he was, it, all, all of it was leaning towards him in his favor. He's fighting at home. He has the big gym recognition and everything. And he's training with all those guys. And for me to go in there and stop all that, that, that to me was really, really cool. I don't know if you were like a, a pro wrestling fan in, in like the late nineties, early two thousands. But like, I remember, you know, Kurt Angle had the three eyes, you know, he always talked about the three eyes and intensity, intelligence. Uh, oh, I forget the third one, but he had three eyes, but you went into this fight with like the three C's calm, cool and collected. I mean, you were just so relaxed, man. It was so noticeable. It was like, you were going for a walk around the neighborhood, not getting in there for a potential 15 minute fight with another human being. Like, how would you, how would you describe like the hour 30 minutes before the fight? Like it was, was it the same feeling? Just super relaxed? Yeah. I was just super relaxed. It was uh, one of those things for me that I just knew what I had to do. Uh, I know he, I know like one of those things that he's, I, I don't know if he was trying to rile me up or whatever, but none of that stuff like kind of really bothers me. Like, especially like the week of he was talking mess or like uh, he was in other interviews. He's like, who is he for? Like, he's like, he's this hype guy. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to drown this guy and everything. I know he was trying to do that for hype, for hype reasons. To me, it just never really bothers me. And like, I know, like one of the biggest things that help that helps me be calm is just one of those that, dude, this, I love doing this. This is, this is my dream. I, I, every single time I go out there, like right before I walk out and I'm just like, man i'm about to go out there and like live my dream again this is amazing this is fun like i was uh like like it's just one of those things that like man why why would i be like nervous about living my dream i was like there's there's no fear in living dreams so to me i was like dude this is fun dude this is really really fun uh, i actually had to calm myself down from being like dude I'm about to go to have some fun and everything so i was like yeah cool calm collected let's let's go it's, it's still a little bit it's still serious so you guys still gotta go out there and be calm but even whenever i was in there i was telling myself three c's man cool calm and collected right right after that fight because he was right in between rounds i was telling myself cool calm and collected because i saw that he was like smiling at me doing s- stuff here and there and uh uh, to the point where, man, I didn't even look him look him in his face during the fight. I was looking directly at his chest and again using my peripherals. I was like super zoned in. So it was just an hour and a half of me just being me, like before the fight. So it was just having fun. On our post fight show, a lot of people were were talking about your performance, and I compared your striking. It was like watching a Peter Griffin fight on Family Guy because every time you landed on him, it showed like a welt, a cut, a mark, some sort of discoloration. Like every single shot you landed meant something and it showed something like i know you weren't really looking at his face but at different points were you looking at his face and realizing like every time i'm landing it's showing i was i was looking uh i saw like blood in the first round and i wanted to tell him like you're bleeding (laughs) like i was like hey you're bleeding but uh uh it it like it never came out i was just sitting there it's like oh uh but no i i did notice like his like uh his uh his nose was, was red. I saw his, that he started bleeding a little bit more like as, as the fight went on. Uh, they did a good job. I guess I don't know if it was a nosebleed or what it was, but uh, he like, yeah, I just really didn't. I, I really didn't pay attention too much to that. Honestly, I was just kind of just like throwing. I was like, I knew where I had to land. I was just using my peripherals and I just see blood kind of kind of come down every once in a while. Uh, but other than that. Yeah, I just wasn't really looking at his face, like. But that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's pretty cool that you compared it to a pretty driven fight because, but like I I just remember him just uh, fighting that chicken every single time <laughs> they, go at, they go at it for like a whole episode. <laughs> You dropped him in the second, and I mean, obviously, you were fully in control at this point. You, you were wearing on him throughout the fight. Were you and your team, like, were you guys feeling confident between the second and third rounds on the stool that the end was near, that you were probably one more clean shot away from ending this thing? No, we we uh, we never really uh, kind of, like, tell, tell, like, we kind of just don't, like, go finish him or anything like that. It's more of a keep doing what you're doing. If the shot presents itself, you know, take it. 
And it was one of those things that my coaches, like once I came back, uh, came back to the corner, he was like, all right, cool. Look, he's lost, he's lost two rounds. He's going to come out. He's going to come out very aggressively. He's either going to want to come out very aggressively and start looking to wrestle you, try to take you down because he's not winning the stand up. He's like, so just, just be weary that he's going to might, might take a shot, get more explosive and try to come at you. So immediately when that, when that round started, just took the center. So it was just one of those, uh, it, it it was just one of those that we just like it, the shot presented itself and I just took it. So um, like I even told told my coach in the corners like yeah he, like I I'm starting to see everything that's coming like he, everything I'm starting to see his motions and everything is like all right cool like if you see the shot take it um, but just be cautious because he's gonna start throwing to the wind he's either gonna look to knock you out or take you down either one so just be cautious and. Uh, that's exactly what happened. Like came out there, and I was pretty. It was pretty cool that it happened. Like when the, the beginning, of, like like in 27 seconds. So that's that was pretty cool. Because and it was also a good read because that's exactly what his corner was telling. It's like you got a gun for the knockout. You guys start looking to take him down. You guys start doing something differently because you're not fighting. So it was really it was really cool. Like we were pretty much planned and prepared for that, and that's exactly what happened. Best performance of your career. Oh, absolutely. I think it was really flawless. But at the same time, like I look and I have a black eye and I'm like, yeah, no, I can, I'm going to go back, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to the drawing board and judge myself really, really harshly. Cause I got touched up in the face a little bit. I got a little bit reckless in some, in, in some cases. So I got to go back to the drawing board uh, and fix and add those, uh, fix those things in my game. So, uh, I would say in my UFC, yes, best performance, Best performance, especially uh, coming coming in about like how tough the opponent was. You know, he he went 15 minutes with Marab and the guy that the the top 15. So to me, I best performance hands down. Uh, but I still I'm judging really harshly on myself, so it's kind of hard for me to go up there and do that. It's hard to even see the black eye, man. Like you can barely <laughs> say, I didn't even notice it until you said anything. <laughs> I feel like Saul Salise is is starting to get some more street cred these days, man. Like which is crazy because. He had a lot of it back in the day with like Tito and Rico and Rampage and those guys. But now seeing what you've been able to do as of late, we're starting to see his name come up a little bit more. He's been flying under the radar over the last several years. But what is it like for you to see him start to get uh, some shine again in 2021? Yeah, he, 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 uh, he tries to stay out of it. <laughs> he tries to stay out of it, man. Uh, that's the thing, man. I, I tell, I, I tell him all the time. like, man, coach, like you don't take credit for any of this stuff. And, like he, uh, he tells me all the stuff that he's done and everything, but he never goes out there and says it. I'm just like, man, I was like, whenever I get there, man, you're not, you're not going to hide behind the camera. Cause he was in, uh, on her, on her championship run. He was, uh, behind Chris Cyborg. He was training her for, for all those fights, but you know, it was, he was the MMA head coach and he had Jason Perlow, the boxing coach and all that stuff. So, uh, he was there for, for Chris Cyborg, for Chris Cyborg's uh, title run and everything. So it was, uh, so he had like like he had he's like had some fighters up there now but man on, honestly like he just doesn't like to talk about it even in those embedded videos i remember seeing a glimpse of him once in brazil whenever he was there with chris cyborg it's like you could see him literally run out the shot <laughs> he doesn't want to be in the video or anything like that so man he he, he doesn't want to take the shine away from any of the fighters but i told my i, I tell him all the time I was like hey you're, you're, you're going to get it from me, whether you like it or not. Like, I'm going to make sure that people know who you are. You deserve this. I know you don't like it, but you to, you to me have done so much for me. So I'm going to make sure you get it back. Uh, and however I can, whether it's giving you credit or doing, doing what I can. So a hundred percent, like I, I'm loving that he's, that he's getting the notoriety, especially Michael Bisping going out there and shouting him out. You know, I remember, I remember my coach saw, uh, remember he, uh, Saul telling me about the time that he trained, he trained him for the, uh, trained him for the ultimate fighter. So to me, I was like, man, that's, that's big. That's huge. So it's pretty cool. So after the fight, you, you're speaking with Paul Felder and you basically say like, Hey, I want to get on that 262 card. It's in Houston, full house on May 15th. That must've put a little extra pep in your step on Friday to find out that 262 was going to be in front of a big crowd in Houston. Did it not? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, like I immediately knew what I wanted to say in the, in the post fight, in the post fight, uh, post fight uh interview i wanted to say that for sure I, I definitely wanted to get that as soon as i saw that that it came out oh 262 is going to be uh may 15th in houston houston uh Tiotis, and i was like yeah hell yeah I, and i know exactly what i'm saying right after right after my win 
Uh, yeah, so I, I was going out there, like, I was planning out what I was going to say. Didn't come out the way I wanted to, but I definitely want to get out. I would definitely want to get on that card. Yeah, you, you had a name in mind. You called out Nate Maness because he obviously called you up before, but he's obviously booked to fight Tony Gravely on April 17th. So, I mean, who knows? Maybe he can turn around quickly after that fight, but I would say probably unlikely if we're being honest. But listen, you're 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 in this crazy division. There's a lot of 35ers who are really good that, that are looking for fights, man. At the end of the day, I'm sure it doesn't even matter. You just want to be on that card, right? Oh yeah, I absolutely want to be on that card. I just had I just had a, like a little back and forth with Nate just just now before we got on. Really? Got on, <laughs> I thought I Twitter, Twitter, Twitter's complicated, man. I'm still learning the ropes. I'm not a social media guy. I'll tweet something here and again and just leave it at that. But I thought he did a little tweet and delete, and uh, I go back and like like uh, I saw that I saw something, and then like someone told us like I went back and someone added me at at the thing. I was like, oh, he didn't. Uh, I saw what I did. They have tweets and tweet and replies. And I saw that and I was like, oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> like, I'm a super idiot. So, yeah, I, I no shame in my game. I'm leaving everything up. I don't care. Uh, but uh, I saw that he was like, uh, he's down. He's he, he, he's down for a fight. So uh, he he even said like he, he's I don't know. I don't know if he meant it towards my fight or like uh, May 15th, but. He said he already he like he he signed the contract and ready to go like as soon as possible. So, man, maybe something happened. I don't know. Maybe he was maybe that Tony Gregory fight didn't happen because that's when I was like, hey, like I even said, it's like, well, people saying you already have a fight lined up. If you have a fight lined up, worry about that one first. Then we can scrap after. Uh, that would be a good one. Uh, honestly, the only reason why I really want to get that fight is just because he called me out and you know back like. In, in the real world, when someone calls you out, you know you got to answer it, or else you, you're kind of you're kind of a scared kid. You know, you're kind of scared. Not in those words, much worse. But uh, you know, so I'm just answering the call out. If he fights, he fight. If he, and I just wanted to show him, hey, I'm calling you back out. So if anything goes differently, it's on you. It's not on me because I'll sign that contract all day, every day. Uh, but if that fight isn't isn't there for May 15th, I definitely will want to try to get that guy at. It's a it's a great fight. It's a great fight just because of the style matchup. Uh, you got that Davy Davy Grant. I think he just had a spectacular knockout not not too long ago. Uh, I saw some people saying his name. So, you know, if that's the, that, if that's a fight, that's a fight I would like. He's coming off a big knockout. I'm coming off of a, a two big knockouts in my use in my UFC career. So I think that would be a great. I think it'd be a great fight. I think it'd be a really great fight. I was the uh, initial conductor of that train for you and Davy Grant, but uh, unfortunately, <laughs> when Davy fights, he breaks something in that fight, so he broke his foot. So that probably it's still there, but just yeah. <laughs> everybody. But let me. But the beauty of of my job is I do a bunch of different shows, and one of them is a matchmaking show where after these events, we, me and one of my colleagues, we jump on here the next day, and people give us ideas of who they want to see you fight. And the most popular name that has popped up thus far is Montel Jackson, who fought on the card. He got a quick knockout, and he's probably looking to turn around quick. And I got to tell you, just because I'm a fan of both of you guys, that fight, the idea of you two, get, two guys getting after it, that scratches me right where I itch, Adrian. I'm not going to lie. What are your thoughts on that matchup? Man, honestly, any matchup, man. Honestly, any matchup. I, I don't care who it is. It's, you can't run in the UFC. You can't run from anybody. You, you, you can't. You can't. Honestly, there's a lot of people that say you can cherry pick in the UFC. No, you can't. Everybody here is tough. So you really can't pick your next opponent. I'm down for anybody. Like, <laughs> like man, I said, I said it in the, I said it like whenever my UFC career started and I said, anybody can and will get it. So man, Hey, every, anybody can get it. Anybody can get it, man. Let's go. Like, it doesn't matter who it is, man. Uh, respect Montel, Montel Jackson. Uh, respect to him. Uh, he, uh, some food accidentally got uh, sent to our room, and it was his. So that was for, like, he's he's a cool guy. He's a real cool guy. So uh, yeah. So anybody, man, I, I, it doesn't matter. Yeah, the division is just amazing right now because I mean, w what a what a busy week for the division and for you know big events because we found out that. Dillashaw's coming back. He's fighting Corey Sanhag in May 8th. We still get the title fight rematch between Sterling and Jan to look forward to. Rob Font's fighting Cody Garbrandt May 22nd. Van White's just cooking right now, man. I mean, these upcoming fights in your world will be exciting, but once you crack into the top 15, man, it's only going to get better and better, and the tests are going to get stiffer and stiffer. Like, when you think about the future, man, how excited are you for some of these matchups that you could p potentially get? Like, I, I, man, I, I, I said it once, and I'll say it again, dude. It's a... It's a 
it's it's a bunch of killers, man. It's a bunch of killers, and it excites me because this this is this is like I, this is really really cool because we have a wave of like new like thirty fivers who are all tough, all tough killers, and like we got a wave, and you have to se- separate yourself from that pack, and that's what I plan on doing. Like I want to be the killer of the killers, man. That's exactly what I'm trying to be. So. Seeing seeing all those guys up there, you know, it just excites me, man. I'm like, like it, like I I want to get better. I like I want to get better, and it's like so. Whenever I fight them, it's it's super easy for me. Like I know right now I can go up there and compete with those guys, but I want to be able to go up there and make sure they can't compete with me. You know, that's that's my goal, and that's the biggest thing. What I'm trying to do. So, oh uh, man, it it just excites me, and I just know I have so much more to improve. And whenever I improve, they're gonna be in trouble. How you mentioned, we, we talked about the three C's in the octagon and I'm curious, like how that translates outside of it, because it, it's got to be a very important thing to have when thinking about the future, like staying calm, cool, collected. You're coming off a big win like this. Everyone's ready to like throw you into the top 10, the top five, like give this guy a top 15 guy after two fights and you take it if you got the chance. But how important is it just to maintain those three C's, enjoy the ride, move up the ranks, kind of maintain that composure through all this hype that you've rightfully earned? Man, I, I just see what's already been done before me. You know, I, like I can go back and name a, a lot of great names. Like you got like Max Holloway. Look how long it took for him to get into the into the top fifteen to even get a title shot. Tony Ferguson's another one of those guys. Look how long it took for him just to get get up there and get to a title shot. Stephen Miocic. Look how long it took for him to to work to get up to to a title shot. <laughs> look at Dustin Poirier to to like finally be like the guy. It took him took them such a long long time. Like in Donald Cerrone, like we got a lot. There's a lot of examples of like fighters, like not that Donald Cerrone took his time. He fought anybody on any given week, you know. But like, look how long it took for a lot of these fighters, you know, to get to the position they were they're at. So like, it's it's just one of those things that whether if they rush me, they rush me. But if not, if not, I don't mind being a workhorse. You know, there's there's a lot of fights there. There's a lot of opportunities. So there's never gonna be like a a need for me to have to get a fight at the top 15 i in the position that i'm at right now i can easily like fight somebody in the top 25 and the next fight get a top 15 guy or i can fight a top a top 50 guy a top 50 guy who's still a really good killer and next thing you know i'm fighting a top 40 top 30 top top 25 then top 20 then top 15 if it takes me that long so to me it's just you know like I'm just, I just take it as it comes, man. If, if it's going to come faster, faster or if it's going to take its time, you know, I don't care. Like it's, it's one of those things that I take it as it comes. Just keep getting those bonuses, man. Then it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah that's exact. That's another reason why I'm like, hey, you know, keep me fighting at the end for sure. It's going <laughs> to be tough to get at the top. <laughs> 50 Gs, man. What are we, what are we, what are we going to do with this, with, with this bonus? Saving it, man. I, I, that's my biggest thing. My man. man. I, that, that's my biggest thing. I don't want to be become another thirty. I don't want to be a thirty for thirty man. That's the biggest thing, and I, I want to save it. I want to invest it. I don't want like after this is all said and done. I don't want to have to work. That's uh, and also I, I don't want to have to fight for money. I want to have to. I want to be able to fight for fun. Like that's that's the thing, you know. I so just imagine me. There's no stress on me right now with work. Like no stress on me right now with work. You know I can go out there fight fight freely because i don't have to worry about like man if, if he checks one of my kicks uh i'm limping i'm limping for three two or three weeks you know i did, did like uh, my job is going to be a lot harder and this and that but uh now where me not having to worry about money going out there like man i can go out there and just go nuts <laughs> i can go, out and go nuts you know so that's 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 where i want to get to man that's exactly where i want to get to because I love, I love fighting, man. I love the, I love the sport. I love martial arts, and you know, if I don't have to worry about, if I don't have to worry about money, you're gonna start me seeing me start throwing a little bit, a little bit crazier. <laughs> Last thing, uh, what will fighting at Toyota Center mean to you? I mean, I've talked to like tons of fighters who get to fight in their hometown, and it's like a dream of theirs. You know, fighters talk about MSG all the time. What will, what will fighting at Toyota Center mean to you? Man, it, it would mean like a lot, man. It, this is where I started. Houston is where I had my first fight. Like Houston's where I've had like a lot of ups and downs. You know, it's like it, it's it's to me it's home and it's 
like like man like i it's just it'd be just crazy that i would be able to fight at the Taylor center because man I, i'd be telling my dad almost all like every single time he took me to uh go train like we'd see we'd be exiting we'd be exiting and hitting the exit on sky on 45 i for uh interstate 45 we're going down we'd take an exit scott and whenever we take that exit you see directly straight across you see the toyota center and i'd always be telling my dad it's like one day i want to fight there like i want to fight there in the ufc and my dad looked at me as like in, in in due time you stay consistent keep doing what you're doing and you'll be there like i, I believe in you so like to me, it's just one of those things that, like, yeah, I, it would mean a lot. It would mean more. It would mean more, more to me than like just fighting any anywhere else. Because that's one thing that I've told my dad. Like, I'm gonna fight there. So another promise to keep, man. I gotta go out there. Hopefully, I get it. I really want. I really want to fight May 15th. Definitely a guy to keep an eye on. Buy some stock in Adrian Yanez, and it would be an absolute travesty if he is not on that UFC 262 card in Houston. A travesty. This is a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer of all no-brainers. That man should be fighting on that card. Of course, that piece of business, finding out it's in Houston, dropped over the last few days. And we also found out that the main event for that card, we're going to crown a new UFC lightweight champion. Charles Oliveira is going to fight Michael Chandler. We'll have a new champion. Habib stays retired, which... Let's be honest, everybody knew, except Dana White, apparently. But I also understand that he had to try to get him back. If there's any chance, he was going to try to make it happen. I never, I didn't think it was going to happen. I don't know. I actually started to buy into it a little bit more. Probably for like a week, I thought it was possible. And then everything got shut down. Didn't happen. Habib moves on, as he should. And uh, we're going to have a new champion on May 15th. And... We got a lot of big fights coming our way over the next few months, so let's get excited for that. But let's move ahead to our next guest. Let's get an update from one of the top 145 pounders on the planet, Josh Emmett. All right, let us say hello to a man that a lot of people have been asking about for the last several months here on MMA Fighting. So I thought, let's just bring him on. Let's get the answers from the man himself, the seventh ranked 145 pounder in the world. Josh Emmett joins the program. How are you, man? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm doing great. It's great to have you here. And the last time we saw you, you had that incredible performance, that incredible fight with Shane Burgos, his unanimous decision win. And you did so with a litany of injuries. I think it was a like a torn ACL. You had a slightly torn MCL. There's, I think there's a fractured femur in there. And I know I'm, yeah. I'm missing a few, but I know you had a bit of a chip on your <clears throat> shoulder heading into that fight. But to have that type of performance and to do it on one freaking leg, essentially, like what does that mean to you and your confidence overall moving forward? Yeah, no, I, um, man, I, Shane's a, he's an awesome guy. He's a good fighter. Um, I knew it'd be a tough test, but I just feel like, um, you know, I, I just know my capabilities. And so I wanted to go in there. I wanted to show the fans kind of new things that we've been working on and just a completely new game. And, and that all went out the window 15 seconds into the first round. So I, I just kind of, I couldn't move, like I couldn't move that well. I had to put on a, a poker face um, because it hurt like hell and, and I had no stability and a lot of people, uh, you know, it's funny cause they're like, Oh, the adrenaline, you must not have felt that. I'm like, Oh, I felt it. That, there's a reason why you don't see NFL players you know, playing the last, uh, the last quarter after they, they tear their ACL. But yeah, no, it was, it was a good, uh, a good fight. And, uh, I, I was just frustrated cause I, I knew I hurt my knee and then it turned out to be worse than I expected. Plus, um, yeah, I, I was just frustrated about the whole knee and I didn't get to go out there and like implement my game plan. But, um, in hindsight, I, I got the win, um, and got, I uh, got a bonus. So, you know, I got three checks, so I can't I can't complain. I'd be in a lot worse place if I, you know, lost that fight. It's interesting because kind of hearing your perspective on it, because to a lot of people, that was like an eye opening performance. And you, you mentioned it like after the fight, like people sort of had the narrative heading in that, you know, you were the you were the knockout guy. You were the one shot guy. But Shane was the more well-rounded guy. And, you know, if you don't stop him and land that that solid one punch to that, that, that you've used so many times before, Shane's going to win the fight. And, and I know you saw members of the media sort of paint that picture themselves as well. Was that a little frustrating for you? you or did you kind of use that as as fuel for the fire so to speak 
But yeah, it was a little, it's, it's a little frustrating, but I'm always the underdog. So I feel like, uh, you know, my last three fights, four, maybe four or five fights, I've been the underdog, you know, big underdog. So, uh, I just, I don't know. I just, at the time I was just like, man, when, when are they ever going to give me credit? But, uh, everyone thinks I'm just like a, a short stocky guy with the overhand, right? But I, I come from a re- wrestling background. I feel like in a lot of different, you know, um, facets of the game I, I feel like you know i feel like i'm better here i'm better there and, and i do that with a lot of my opponents but um no yeah of course i use uh use it as like fuel to you know fuel the fire but at the end of the day i just i just kind of focus on what i need to do to uh be victorious it's it's interesting just seeing you like you come into the UFC and I believe it was your first fight you had the the the, the thing with the finger and then you became the the overhand right guy and now I feel like people are starting to see you for who you really are like and I know it was on one leg you couldn't show everything but are you starting to feel like a little momentum now after that win? Yeah, no, definitely. Um and I feel like me in my career it's been like I I've had some momentum and then I I get sidetracked but before that fight, you know, Dana was even talking about, you know, Burgos and I, the winner of that was going to be in talks of like a contender and be in the likes of the guys in the top three, the top five. Um, and, you know, I, I was there. I, I beat the number three ranked guy my second fight at featherweight. I was ranked fourth. I just had a, a minor setback. So I took him the long route to, to climb my way back. I'm almost to where I was at a few years ago. Um, but, yeah, there, there's only one thing in my sight, you know, that I'm kind of gunning for. So, um, yeah, I I just got to keep working. I got to first recover, uh, heal this knee up. And then, uh, man, I'm working every day to get better. And, uh, I I think the fans will be in, uh, you know, they'll they'll be in for something when I, when I do come back, you know, I'll get it, I'll come back stronger than I was before. I'll get to implement that, that, uh, spectacular showing that I wanted to with Burgos that I didn't get to. So, so I am excited for the return when that comes. So I, I was going to ask you about that. Like how has the rehab, the recovery been going? Like, how are you feeling around nine or so months later? Like where would you kind of gauge the percentage at with the knee right now? Man, it's uh, it's hard just because I've had, uh, I've had, it's just been like, I feel like a roller coaster ride. I feel like I'm almost at the bottom of the roller coaster. Uh, just cause I've had so many issues. I've, I had, um, you know, I did the ACL reconstruction and I used the patellar tendon. So I've had tons of anterior knee pain where they took the graft. And with me, um, I was doing really well in PT. I started physical therapy the next day after surgery. I stayed in Vegas for um, a little shy of two months. And I was doing like two a days. I was working with Heather and, uh, and Bobby out at the PI twice a day doing physical therapy. I was working with Bo doing strength and conditioning. And um, they said I was like way ahead of the game. I wanted to be, you know, the, the Adrian Peterson of MMA. I was like, I'm going to come back. I'm going to be the, the first person she clears under six months and I'm going to fight. And then for whatever reason, um, maybe at like the three month marker when I was back here, I was doing things and I kept complaining about pain in the the patella and um i talked to the surgeon and he said that's just let's see if it goes away in a month or so so at the four month marker it was it was getting even worse and so we did an mri and where they took i don't know if you know how they they take the grafts well they take they like slice down your your patella tendon and they they go bone from your patella bone from your tibia and then in the center is your your patella tendon so they take that out for whatever reason my patella tendon did not heal together and my my patella was just had a big piece of the bone out so he's like well you have a fractured patella and a torn patella tendon he's like no wonder why you're having so much pain but i kept just going through all the workouts and stuff because i would ask the pts i was like like there's pain here and i i can i can trust me i can deal with pain so i'm like as long as this is not affecting my acl they're like no that that's not affecting your acl i was like okay so i just kept doing it until i got the the image and then we had to kind of taper down, kind of figure out another game plan. I have a friend and doctor here in Sacramento that um, is big into, you know, stem cells. And he, he does a lot of research out of UC Davis and, and things like that. And so, uh, you know, I, I did ultrasound with him and he, we set up a, a game plan to do the stem cells. So I went into his clinic and he, you know, they, he drilled into my, my SI joint, so my back on both sides, literally with like a power tool, like a drill and then extracted the bone marrow and then they spin it like they do PRP and then injected it into the 
into the patella. So right through my kneecap, right all into the the patella tendon to hopefully create some type of growth factors. And, uh, and it did. So it's been three months tomorrow since I did that procedure. And, uh, I have responded well to that because I, I went and saw him six weeks after. And before it was like a complete like circle, just a hole black, there was no healing. And then when I saw him six weeks after the procedure, it was like a, like almost like a zipper shape so it did heal and there was like some speckles in there so that's that's a good thing um so i do the another mri tomorrow and then next week i'm going to go do another ultrasound i don't think it's it's healed completely because i still have pain in it but i can do things that there i couldn't even do a fraction of that so so i am getting better but it's just too soon to tell i, I kept saying i want to fight in july or august but as I'm kind of still dealing with this, I'm like, that's not going to happen. So in my mind, I, I will fight this year. I just, I don't know yet. It's, it's a little too soon still. So how, so would you say like that, the whole thing with the patella probably knocked you back like three or four months? Yeah, I would, I would say so. Cause I, I did the, yeah, I'd say about three, four months. You're right. Um, because other than that, my ACL is strong though. I know that it's super strong, but it's just, I can't, I can't do a whole lot with that, that anterior knee pain. Um, and, and there's really nothing I could have, could have done for whatever reason. I didn't respond well to the surgery and, uh, I just didn't, you know, cause he, the surgeon I went to, he did not suture that tendon and, and some don't, they just think it grows back together. And for whatever reason, mine didn't. So, um, I think it is now, but I'll, I'll find out more tomorrow and, uh, and next week for sure. It's crazy, man. Uh, and since you've been gone, there's like, there's been some big fights at 145 and you know, we, there's the title fight like a month after your fight between Volkanovski and Holloway, super close fight. Then we saw Brian Ortega beat Korean zombie, earned his title shot. And then in January, Max Holloway and Calvin Cater headlined the first ever MMA event on ABC. And I could see, you know, Muhammad Ali behind you. ABC has this long history of combat sports on their network. What has it been like for you watching this division since your fight with Shane and, and, and everything you've had to deal with, man? Man, it's, uh, I don't know. For, for me, I always try to find the positive. At, at first, it's, it's super frustrating, but then I'm, you know, I, I truly believe everything happens for a reason. So I feel like, you know, maybe when I do come back, you know, everyone like that you said is they've been fighting each other and they're going to kind of weed themselves out and then I'll come back to something bigger than I would have if I would have just kept fighting. Because even when I was out in Vegas um, getting ready to, to fight Burgos, um, Sean Shelby was already talking to my manager and he's like, Hey, we need Josh in August or September, something like that. And and I was like, Hey, let me win this fight first, you know? So I, so I know I would have fought already again. And, and that's the only, it, the frustrating thing is I, I feel so good besides my knee, you know, even though I was like, I had some black eyes and some cuts and stuff, but a week, um, after the fight, I literally felt so good. And, <laughs> And then I'm just like sidelined. So I'm watching all these fights. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the, the sport anyways. I always have been. So I watch every fight religiously, every card that I can. And yeah, I, I, they've been some amazing fights, you know, and everyone's looking really good. And, I, you know, I'm itching to get back in there. But it also motivates me in, in physical therapy and training. I'm hitting mitts with my boxing coach. I'm, I'm doing strength and conditioning and doing PT, you know, four or five times a week. So I'm, I'm, I'm literally working super hard every day, but Sunday and, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, that fire's lit. That's for sure. What did you think of, um, of Max's performance against Calvin Cater? Like John, I had John Anik on a couple of weeks ago and he said that was the single greatest performance he had ever seen sitting cage side watching fights. What did you wow. make of his performance and, and where would you kind of rank that one overall? Yeah, no, for sure. It's like, how, how can you argue with that? It's like, it, it was an amazing, amazing fight. And then, you know, what he did to Cater, because Cater's been doing so well and looking so good against everyone. And then Max just went out there and completely outclassed him. And, you know, several times I thought they should have stopped the fight just because, you know, I'm thinking about Cater and, and just all fighters, like longevity of the sport. You know, if, if you're, you're clearly losing a, a fight, you know, and you're taking that much damage, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not good, but yeah, it was, it was, yeah, I'd have to say it was up there with one of the best performances as well. You know, it was, you know, I, I think everyone was saying just just how great of a fight that was. And it was awesome that it was the first one ever on ABC and, you know, uh, the history there. And, yeah, he, he went out there and uh, outclassed him and, and performed 
you know, great. <laughs> yeah, it was just wild to even like look at the numbers and just be like, wow. Like, yeah, he set tons of records, right? <laughs> and that so fight. Crazy. Was, yeah. 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 I remember talking, I, I spoke with uh, Calvin's coach and manager like right after the fight. It was probably like a month or so later. And obviously, he took a lot of heat for not stopping the fight. And, and the thing he kept saying was, we wanted to. Like, we were so close. Like, we thought Herb was going to stop it. And then, right when we we're about to throw the towel, like, Calvin would land a big shot. Like, Max would light him up, and then Calvin would land a big shot. And then he went into the corner, and I talked to Calvin. He's like, What's up? I'm fine. Yeah. I'm all here. I'm good to go. So, like, he's like, I just couldn't. Basically, in a way, he was saying, like, Calvin earned the right to get that ass whooping. You know what I mean? And, and still yeah. had his wits about him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it's got to be tough, too, because, you know, I've talked to, uh, you know, to Joey, that's my boxing coach, Joey Rodriguez before. And, and he's told me several times, like we actually watched that fight together. Um, but, but that fight and, and other fights, he was telling me too, like years and years, cause we've been working so long together. He's like, if you're ever in this position, you're, you're doing this and this, I'm throwing in the towel. I'm like, don't you dare. But, but <laughs> at, in the end he's, you know, he's, he's looking out, but I would be so pissed. And, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I know he's like looking out for what's best for me, even though I'm like, all fighters were like focused just on what's going on in the moment. You know, we're not thinking about, you know, a year, five, 10, 15 years later, you know, but it's, uh, yeah, it would, it'd be tough. So I, I would hate to be in, you know, that, that position of Calvin's coach too. You know, it's, it's, what do you do? You know, regardless you throw it in, you're going to get all this heat. You don't, you get all this heat. It's like, but the people that are doing that don't know shit about it. So <laughs> 100%. Yeah. yeah. So I know like your, your normal, like original timeline, you thought maybe like July, August, you'd be able to get back in there. You don't think that's going to be feasible. So you think it no. maybe like October, November, maybe like, is that best case scenario? Yeah, possibly. Yeah. October, November, possibly best case. You know, like I feel like even just talking to my physical therapist, he's thinking like somewhere towards the end of the year. So, um, with me, I'm always, I'm like, how about this? And he's like, we'll see. I think he, I think he was just putting it in my head um a while ago and and i was just i was like i'm glad you said that just because i you know i've been thinking about it and i'm like i can't even i can't do a whole lot and then there's no way i can hop in there and fight and knowing me i'm always rushing things so i can get back and fight and he's like you don't want to rush this um so but i'm like i will fight this year um i'm just not sure yet and then unless the mri comes back and they're like oh it's it's a hundred percent healed. Then I know it's just a mental thing and I'll push through whatever to like get it going. But I, I don't think that's the case because when I do certain things, I, I feel a lot of pain in my knee. How has this affected you mentally? And, and sometimes like, <laughs> especially with the pandemic and stuff, like it can, your mind can actually get sharper. Like you're doing other things, like you're taking your mind off of fighting in some way and focusing it on other things. Like how, how has this stretch of time been for you from a mental perspective? Yeah, it's been tough. Like, um, I could say for sure, you know, the, the two months I was in Vegas and I, I was doing so well and I was doing, I was way ahead of the game. So I was like, I was feeling great. And then when I got the, the MRI and, or I was starting to feel tons of pain, like three months, four months, um, it limited me from doing a lot of the exercises and just PT, you know, I'm doing PT every day and, uh, I can't do things. So it, it starts to get kind of discouraging. And then I get an MRI and they're like, yeah, no wonder why. And I'm one of the lucky ones, you know, this doesn't really happen to people. And so it happened to me. So I'm like, all right. And then I'm like, I go down the rabbit hole and I'm doing all my research and I'm seeing different people that I talk to. So I think that messed with me a little bit more. And then, um, you know, even doing the stem cells that, that was a long, um, procedure to kind of recover from like they drilled into my back so technically i fractured back on you know um and then it was so painful i was in a cat or a brace no weight bearing for a week and then i was in a straight leg um brace again for another like two three weeks on crutches and i feel like i, I lost all the mobility again i felt like my quad atrophied again and so I, I had to start over um so it's it's been it's been it's been tough that's for sure and then you know just yeah, I just think, you know, I, sometimes I'll think like bad things, like I'm, I'm not getting better. I'm getting older. You know, I start, you know, just thinking things I shouldn't like, oh, this, my knee's never going to get better. Like things like this, like my career is over, but, um, I, I know it's not. And, but yeah, it's been tough. That's, that's for sure. My mentality. Um, I haven't really, you know, done a whole lot like 
because of the pandemic, everything shut down and I'm so focused on recovery. So I'm, I'm working every day, like I said, six days a week, multiple times a day doing different things. So I solely focused on this during this time still, you know, so it hasn't really taken my mind off. I'm, I'm just like nonstop. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm eating good. I'm, I'm working out. I'm trying to do what I can. So when I do get back to practice and a hundred percent, I'll be able to just like accelerate like no other. And then it'll get me back into a fight. Do you even think about like matchups, potential opponents? Like I know like positionally there's, you know, you want to get to the title and that's where you want to go, but are you even allowing yourself to like think about who you would fight next or who you'd want to fight next and like how things might line up by the time you're ready to return? Yeah, no, yeah, no, of course I've thought about that a lot. It's, uh, it's tough though. Cause all these, everyone keeps fighting, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to come back here and then everyone fights and then people are losing. And, and then, you know, I had this other setback. So I, I do want to fight up. It, the funny thing is it's like every time a featherweight fights and then, <laughs> and then someone gets a knockout or something, it's always like, Oh, they need to fight Josh. Him. And I'm like, well, if, if they have a, you know, a, a, a one through six in front of them, like, okay, then let's do it. But I'm not fighting behind me. Like, I made that clear. I'm not going to fight anyone behind me because otherwise I, I, my last handful of fights, I'm always fighting back. Like I'm never going anywhere. Um, I'll stay stagnant. And, and, and I do want to get closer to that title. I want, I want big fights. I, I know what I can do. I, I've been doing this for so long. So, um, yeah, I definitely, I would like someone in the top three, the top five, uh, when I do come back to a, to a big fight, but then who knows anything can happen with, you know, this sport, you know, uh, injuries can happen and people can fill in so as soon as i can <laughs> i can do whatever like i'll be ready you know four week notice that's all i need i i got the burgos fight four weeks it was a little sooner than i would have liked but um you know i i said i, I can't take a fight unless it's at least four weeks out because the weight is uh it's challenging for me to get down to I remember a couple of years ago we chatted. I'm trying to remember who you beat. I don't know if it was the Michael Johnson fight or maybe the one after that. Uh, and Jose Aldo was like on the top of your list. You're like, I want yeah. the Jose Aldo fight. He was kind of like your your brass ring, so to speak. Like you wanted to get to the title, but Aldo was like the guy. You really wanted to fight him. Uh, it was after the Bechtick fight. Then. The Bechtick yeah, fight, I, that's what I beat, it was. I beat, I beat Johnson in March and then Bechtick in June. And then I wanted to fight, uh, I wanted to fight Aldo at MSG in November. That's right. That's what it was. Yeah. That's what it was. Because uh, he's, he's a legend. And, and, and so it's like that. Like, I, I think, you know, I don't know. It's it's hard for me. Like, like I believe in myself, my coaches, my teammates, friends, everyone. So it's like, I, I want to come back to, to a huge fight, you know, a title eliminator, you know. Um, I, I was so close in 2018. You know, I, I was ranked fourth in the world in 2017, 2018. I could have, it could have, there could have been a title eliminator fight, but I had a, a setback and all this, all these things happen, you know, but, um, if I would have thought about it more as a, from a business standpoint, like a lot of fighters do, I was just like, you know, I, I've always said yes to every single fight. I've still never turned a fight down, even though I've seen people say I've turned them down. I was never offered those fights, but every single Sean calls my manager or, and Hey, we got this guy. Yes. Or we have these two guys. Who do you want to fight? I want to fight the bigger guy, the bigger name guy. Um, yeah. So it's kind of, I do want to come back to a big fight though. That's for sure. So now that like Aldo is down at 35, who's kind of like the new Aldo in this division? Like who's the guy that like really stands out to you right now? Well, really everyone is, uh, well, it's kind of, it, it's hard because I don't, I don't know how it really works in the, you know, the top six you have, okay, Cater lost, but he lost to Max, who's like arguably one, the GOAT, you know, uh, and then Zombie lost to Ortega. So would I match up with a someone coming off a loss? Who knows? Or do I fight someone that's on a winning streak like myself that sets me in line for a big win? So anyone else, there's only five people or six people in front of me. <laughs> yeah. And then there's like Zabit, who we haven't seen since November of 2019 and other guys like we're just trying to figure out trying to still piece this thing together because like last year you know i would put like you and shane as like one of the big fights in this division it was like you guys it was cater and ige it was the mm -hmm. title fight and then ortega and zombie and that's it like those are the four yeah. big fights in the whole division last year wow yeah but and then now this year it's kind of we'll see so <laughs> so it's hard for me to even like and i never call anyone out i just want to whoever's going to get me closer to that title. So it's like, 
they told me, hey, fight at welterweight for uh, or middleweight <laughs> for you know title <laughs> eliminator. I'll take the fight. I'll still have to cut to make welterweight. That's <laughs> oh really? Yeah. What do you usually walk I, at? Like, like mid eighties, you know. That's why I could be a middleweight. I I fought at <laughs> welterweight. You know, I, on the regional scene, I, I fought at three different weight classes, and um, yeah, so. So it's a tough cut, that's for sure. Obviously, you know, next Saturday, and it's sneaking up on us. Like, I, I can't even believe that this fight's happening next Saturday, but Volkanovski Ortega for the title. We got two title fights. Everyone's still, like, hung over from UFC 259, and then we're looking at 261 now that Usman and Masvidal are headlining. But we got this fight coming up next Saturday. How do you like that fight? Like, how, how do you see that one playing out between Volkanovski and Ortega? Yeah, it's, uh, man, it, it's tough. Even, even like predicting fights, you know, it's like, because I can always argue how both guys will win. It's, uh, you know, we all know Ortega, he has like, he has the advantage on the ground. I don't think he'll get it to the ground, but he's also, if he's pressured against the cage, we've seen him, you know, pull guillotines and stuff and pull guard from, you know, a standing position. Um, he, he looked great in his last fight, you know, when a, a lot of people were thinking zombie had the advantage on the feet and then he came out, he came out and, and put it on him, you know, almost knocked him out one round and then he was just kind of picking him apart. He was implementing some, some takedowns. Um, I, man, I, I don't know. Cause I, cause I can see how they both win, but Volkanovski has not lost and was he on a 16 fight winning streak or yeah, something like that? Something he hasn't that. lost in the UFC. He's undefeated. He's beat you know max twice he's beat aldo he beat mendez like all these he's in my mind like whoever holds the bell and and the people he's beat it, it's hard to to bet against the champion um especially when they're they're on you know such a high and they're doing so well um but but i'm excited for the fight that's for sure you know i, I i'm not really i could see how both guys could win but if so, I, I'm leaning towards uh, Volkanovski, though. And, you know, he's a champion. He hasn't lost in the UFC. Um, and, and I know Styles make fights, but you see he's beat Max twice. Max beat Ortega, but Ortega's also, you know, looking really good and proved that in his last fight after, you know, a few, I think a few year layoff, right? It was um, it, it was like a year and a half something. or something. Yeah, it was yeah. a while. Yeah. So he shaved his head. He got went bald Brian Ortega and was like a whole different guy, Josh. Saying everyone that's shaving their head, they're doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> there he is, Josh Emmett, and I'll be honest with you, I was hoping that interview would have provided a better, more positive update in terms of his return, but unfortunately it looks like best case scenario, perfect world type of thinking. He's back at the end of the year, November, December. It's super unfortunate because he's excited and ready to come back whenever that time comes. And that win over Shane Burgos, that crazy fight, one of the best fights of the year last year, that was kind of, that was like the fight that really made people appreciate Josh Emmett. It's not just like the dude who can knock people out with one punch, the guy with the overhand right, but an exciting fighter, a guy who can be a top five guy, top three, maybe even fight for a title. I think people really bought in after that fight and the injury just came at the worst possible time. So all the best to Josh. Hopefully we can get back in there sooner rather than later. As we move ahead to another guy who's had some exciting moments at 145 pounds in his career. He also had his final exciting moments as a fighter this past Friday night at BKFC 16. Leonard Garcia joins us right now. All right, we move ahead to our next guest who on Friday night did what all fighters strive to do, go out on top after a dominant five-round unanimous decision went over Joe Elmore at BKFC 16. He announced his retirement from combat sports. Happy to welcome UFC vet, WEC vet, bare knuckle vet, veteran of a lot of different things. Leonard Garcia, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, buddy. Trying to heal up a little bit. My hands still look like Mickey Mouse hands and... Uh, my face is still a little sore, but uh, it, it was good, man. It was, I feel great. When, when, when you lose, it hurts a lot more, but when you win, it doesn't matter. Yeah, hey. absolutely. C congratulations on the win. I appreciate you joining us. Uh, you know, the memorable career, man. First off, now that we're a couple of days into your combat sports retirement, like how does it feel? Like does it feel real? Yeah, it, it definitely does. Um, 
it was funny. I was watching. I always watch boxing. I watch all different things. And I'm watching the guy slipping punches. And we had been working on that so much for this fight especially. And I was like, thank God I never have to worry about slipping another punch, at least in a combat sport, you know, for training and everything. Of course, I'm still going to keep moving around. But at least I got headgear then. But now I, I'm glad I don't have any bare knuckles coming at me. There you go. I mean, you went five hard rounds with a guy. Uh, I believe that was he hadn't lost before in bare knuckle competition. And oh, he was definitely undefeated. Yeah, not anymore. But uh, one of the things you said is you took this fight with Joe to kind of prove that you were the, the top dog at 165 pounds. So I'm curious, did you know heading into the fight that this was going to be it for you? Win or lose, draw, you were stepping in there for the last time? Yeah. Um, when, when, uh, I had been retired for two and a half years when I got the call from bare knuckle and, uh, I was done, you know, I had retired and, um, got this opportunity. So, um, it took about a week to talk my wife into it. Um, the first fight was in Cancun. So that helped a lot. (laughs) Uh, but uh like it, it it was a spiritual search man you know i've been i've been super involved in church uh uh ever since i had retired and uh you know it was just one of those things man i didn't know for sure if i was going to come back or not i didn't know if, if she was going to let me i didn't know if my job was going to let me i didn't know how it was always going to work out so um you know i prayed a lot and really really sat down and thought about it he offered me a three fight deal and i presented those three fights and I said, if I play my cards correctly, if I beat this first guy, I know it's for an international title. It could lead me to the title within these three fights. Um, and I could be the ranked number one guy. So uh, I, I made the deal with her. I prayed about that deal. So I had essentially made the deal with God as well. And then, of course, I went to the company and, and, and made the deal with the company. So um, it was like a... a it all worked out that way. It all made sense to just do three fights. Um, of course, I veered away from the path and entered the 155 tournament when I fought Jim Mailers. And of course, that didn't go my way. And I think that was just a funny way of telling me, don't veer from the path, you know, keep going after it. And then uh, I thought it was crazy that Joe Elmore was calling me out when he was ranked number one. And I was like, I mean, this is it. All the cards aligned. Everything lined up. The only problem was Joe Elmore was a scary individual. You know what I mean? So to say yes to that was like, holy crap. You know, like, what, uh, is this really the path? You know, is this, is, is, is this what it is? But, um, after watching him fight and, uh, really Tom Schof coming down and helping me get ready for him was a massive help mentally like it really really like joe uh, uh tom shelf has no idea what kind of impact he had but for him to spend five rounds in there with a guy like joe and then to come here and tell me you're ready man it just it just all fell together and it fell into place and you never really hear about a guy losing a fight and then fighting the number one guy so that's how i knew god had a little intervention in there and, and a couple things so um to walk away after that with that one deal being made, it was, it was like a surreal thing. And, uh, I just, I'm a man of my word, man. And, and, uh, I've always held true to that. And, and I figured it was the best thing. And, and, uh, really after performing like that, everybody saying, why, why would you leave now? You look better than ever. Like your movement was good. You never got over your feet. You weren't falling down. You were, I mean, you just stayed composed the whole time. So uh, I also think that's when you want to walk away, when people don't want you to go. You don't want to walk away when they're asking you to leave, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. It was ki- the whole thing was like kismet, man. It was like meant to be. That's it, man. That's exactly what it was, man. It was meant to be um, perfect fight, perfect. Uh, e- e- everything just felt so good, man. Uh, training camp was actually fun. Like I hadn't had fun in a training camp for years and uh, it was like the harder I worked, the better it was. We're in the back warming up. And he was like running me through all these combos, like trying to get me to blow my lungs out because it's always good for me to blow my lungs before I go out. 
just because I'm, I'm like a second win type of guy because I'll get my second and third win and I get stronger and stronger. So they, uh, he was trying to get me to blow my lungs out. And he was like, I, I don't know what to do. Go get in the hallway and run some sprints. So I was in the hallway running sprints back and forth. And I would get back and I was just like, you know, and he was like, why aren't you breathing hard? And I was like, I don't know. I'm not getting tired. And he was like, okay, we're ready. So uh, everything, like you said, man, it, it just, it all fell together at the, at the perfect time. So it was good. What did you take away from the bare knuckle experience in general? I mean, you obviously, like you just said, you got yourself in peak physical condition. You weren't getting tired before the fight, running, sprinting up and down the halls. I mean, it's obviously a different world than the MMA sides of thing, side of things. But like, what did you take away from those three fights, especially the final one with Joe? You know, um, every time you're in a fight, anytime that you're competing, there's a feeling that comes on you that. It's like chaos, it's happiness, it's sadness, it's fear, all these different emotions. In bare knuckle, it's intensified by, I, it's like the hair on your body, you can feel it, like on the back of your neck, on your chest, on your sides, like the little bitty hairs that you can't see, you feel those, you feel more alive for some reason. And I think it's just the fact that it's a, the, the, the oldest form of combat. Like if you really sit back and think about it, I mean, there was fist fights, you know, when, when, when Jesus was walking the earth, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's like our, our first line of defense and our last line of defense is your fist. And you, when, when, when you think about that and you get out there and you're competing professionally with only that as your only aspect, I think it's exhilarating. Like for me, um, and I always say it this way, but I don't mean it this way. But what I what I say is, I feel more alive in there than I've ever felt before. And of course, that's hard to say because I'm married to a fantastic woman. I got a beautiful family, so I don't mean it like I feel alive. But like my senses, my everything inside of you is awake. Like your, I don't know if it if it hits different uh, uh, electrodes in your brain or whatever it is, but I definitely it's a definite fence sense of your euphoria. Like it's crazy, man. It's it's it it, it uh, if I could bottle that drink, I'd be a billionaire. <laughs> you know? So uh, that that's the only way to explain it for me. Did you get that same feeling with MMA, or just was this just a new thing altogether? Oh close um you you definitely feel it because there is that um i guess i mean it's the closest feeling to i don't know if it's it, like death kill somebody with your bare hands or what you know what 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 it is but it's like that fear like man uh i almost lost my eye in my second fight i don't know if if, if you knew that i took a a, a knuckle directly to the eyeball the very first punch of my second fight against Jim Mallers and uh this fight against a guy like Joe Elmore who's way more power puncher than Jim Mallers I really wanted to prove that my chin had never been compromised like with 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 the Jim Mallers fight you can see it I just couldn't see anything out of my eye I couldn't see a thing like I I I seen like a red blob was all I could see. And uh, my pupil is actually dilated half the size bigger than my right side for the rest of my life because of the damage that I took in that one fight. Thank God he didn't detach my retina. But the way the doctor explained it to me, I had a hickey on my eyeball after that fight. Like it was, it was, uh, you ever seen a guy that gets that surgery when they get their retina reattached? It looked just like that, like a red eyeball with a black pupil inside it, basically a pupil this big. And uh, that's how my eye was for like three weeks after the, the Jim Ellers fight. But I wanted to prove to people that he never compromised my chin. He didn't hit me to where I never knew where I was at. I knew where I was at the, the whole time. I just knew I couldn't see anything. And I panicked. I went into, you know, they say fight or flight. All I've ever known is fight. And everybody kept telling me, why didn't you just run away for a little bit and get to your corner and sit down? Because everything in my brain was saying, you can't see, hit this guy back right now. 
So I kept running right at him. And every time he'd punch me on this side, it was like getting sucker punched. I thought the referee was punching me. I was like, somebody else is in here hitting me because I, I can't see this guy's fist coming at me. So anybody knows who's taking a cheap shot, which it wasn't a cheap shot. Jim landed a very fortunate punch and he finished the fight. And, and you know, of course, I give him all the respect in the world for that. But I wanted to prove like Joe Elmore was the number one guy for five months straight. They kept ranking him number one. He was crumbling people with every punch. He was just, I mean, if he touched you, you were going down. So I made a deal with my coaches. We were in the back. I said, I'm not going down one time, and I'm never going to show him if he hurts me, and I'm going to put him down. And in the first round, I don't care what anybody says, I put him <laughs> down. That, that was a knockdown. I don't know why, what ref, so what he saw when we were in there, but that was a definitely punch. Like that, that big cut on his forehead from this right hand, and him being on the ground, that was a knockdown. So, um, and, and, you know, of course, respect to Joe Elmore. He, he never was like out of it or anything else. He took everything I could give, but he did go down, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. What's interesting is that the sport has really taken off over the last yeah. couple of years, like especially some of the names that, that have been brought over, like Knuckle Mania, the, the card yeah. page debuted on. That was super fun, man. And a lot of people got to like experience bare knuckle for the first time watching yeah. Paige fight. And we got to know Britton Hart a little bit more and her crazy personality, which is just yeah. infectious. And the fan base just continues to grow. So I'm curious, how big do you think this can get? I, I, I think the sky's the limit, man. I really do. I, I feel like uh, I'm super excited to still be a part of it, um, maybe as a, a commentator or uh, you know, a fighter that, 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 that does interviews with other fighters. Like I know what emotions they are going through. I know what questions they get asked and what questions get on our nerves and all those little insights. So I'm, I'm grateful that they're going to keep me around and, and, and hopefully give me one of those platforms to continue to help the sport grow. And, uh, I know what fans want to hear from us because I, you know, I talk to, I, I conversate with fans all the time. And as a fighter, knowing that having that insight, I think I do a much better job than some of the guys that they have on there now, which they're doing an amazing job. But anything I can do to help grow, it doesn't need help growing. That's a, the crazy thing about it. I really feel like it's like you said, the infectious personalities that are in it and just just the the, the combat aspect of it. It's like the modern day gladiators. You know, it's 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 not like it's. To me, and I hate to say this because I was in the UFC for so long, but I think it's better than the UFC. Um, fight people still show up to MMA fights and they still say, why are they wrestling? Why are they on the ground? Like people are not, people want to see a fist fight. If you don't believe me, go to a boxing match, go to an MMA match, go to a sport baseball game go to a football game if there's a fist fight in the audience everybody in the crowd is like this <laughs> watching that fist fight you know people want i don't know what it is about a fist fight but people love to see those and uh you know the 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 gore and the the knots and the the, the way people look and the the you know we're professional athletes so we take these shots and we keep going they're like oh my god that one would have floored me and, you know, we're still out there. So I think it's just intriguing to people. And uh, I really feel like Dave Feldman is a genius, man. I, I, I wish I had come up with this idea way before he did. And, and essentially, I kind of did. Because uh, in the back back there, when we were in the UFC, they used to make me pick my gloves out. And this one made Dave Feldman call me. Um, they would tell us, pick the glove size that you want. And I was like, give me the extra smalls. And they're like, well, you got to wrap your hand under that. I was like, I don't even care about wraps. Give me the smallest gloves that we got so I can hit them with these. And that's it. And I would always say, why do we wear gloves? You know, we're protecting our knuckles to keep hitting a guy as hard as we can. I get it. But why not let us just go out there and, 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 and be smarter, you know, be a little more technical, land punches a little bit better. Um, and, and, and that's what bare knuckle is, man. So Dave heard about all those things that I used to say. So he reached out to me. He sent me bare knuckle one with uh, Tony uh, and uh, Beltron. I, I can't remember Tony's last name. 
Uh, anyways, those the two big heavyweight guys when they fought each other. He sent me that, and I was like, oh, my God, I have to do this. So, like I said, a week later, I talked my wife into it and made a deal with God, made a deal with the company, and here I was, man. So it worked out. Unreal. And it's funny you say that about, you know, what sticks and what doesn't because, you know, a lot of people who used to complain about wrestling and MMA, people would just be like, well, go watch Glory or go watch Lion yeah. Fight, like watch Muay Thai kickboxing. But it, yeah. the, the kickboxing game and the Muay Thai stuff never really hit in the U.S. Like it, it no. no matter how much they try and how many different yeah. organizations, it just doesn't work. Do you think it's just the name bare knuckle, like just that yeah. thought, that kind of feeling that that makes you know, it so popular? You know, you know what I think it is about bare knuckle as well? Um Watch me and the Elmore fight. Just watch that fight, and you're going to see nonstop action. There is no low in the fight. There is no uh, sitting back, waiting, trying to set something up. Thing about kickboxing, it's an interesting game, but when you get a chess match between two great kickboxers, they set each other up with their legs. They really don't use their hands unless they can follow up on something. And people – don't necessarily when they watch a fight that's what they're there for they want to see a fight and bare knuckle is just that i mean that's all that it is and when when you take a guy like me and joe and you put two guys in there who don't know how to back up who don't know how to retreat who don't know how to surrender because let me tell you i seen blood gushing out of this man's head like it was squirting in the air like a fountain and he was looking at me like, I don't care. You know, I'm coming after you. And I was like, I wanted to like sit back and tell him like, hey, man, you have good blood, good, good, uh, blood gussing out of your head. But, you know, it's it, it's a great thing. And, and, and that's what people want to see, man. That's what it is. I have to ask because, I mean, you've been here before and we've heard retirements and combat sports and they don't often stick and it's an itch yeah. especially when you've been doing this as long as you have it's yeah. hard to ignore can yeah. you confidently say with a hundred percent vigor this is it we absolutely unequivocally saw your last fight yeah absolutely man um because of the way that it happened because of the way that i felt because of um god kept every promise to me so I'm going to hold my word and keep my promise to him as well. And uh, maybe people won't understand that. And maybe they'll say, well, you know, one guy told me, man, you look like you were in your prime. You're crazy to walk away. And uh, that's when you're supposed to walk away. That's when you're supposed to do it. Um, like I said, leave when they don't want you to. Don't leave when they're pushing you out the door. And uh, I still have all my cognitive tissue in my brain. I still talk well. I can still see well. Um, I feel good. So, um, yeah, why, why risk that? When people talk about you, you'll forever be tied to the Korean zombie rivalry, especially that first fight you guys had in yeah. WEC in 2010. One of the all-time great fights. And for new fans who haven't seen that fight, when this interview is over, go watch it. It's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. But you got the split decision there, and he got you the second time around with the twister. Yeah. Is there... I don't think you necessarily is are, are considered... I would say you're not a guy who like lives with regrets at all, but is there like a part of you that wished you could have that third fight with him to kind of answer the question once and for all who the better guy was? I always thought about that. And if you look at the numbers on our second fight, we were identical on punches landed and uh, uh, everything else. So it was all, it was, uh, it's always been a crazy matchup between me and him. I think stylistically we make sense for each other. Our styles just blend so well. Um, I thought about a third fight with him for years. And of course he was climbing the ladder and I was falling down. And so of course, for me, it made way more sense to try to fight a guy who was on his way up. And for him, it didn't make sense to fight a guy that was on the way down. Um, our paths did cross tight twice. We are one and one. I'm comfortable with that. I think he is as well. We're actually pretty decent friends. We have a, uh, a speech uh, difference, but his commentator tells me good things. So hopefully he's telling me the truth. Um, we... Uh, or his translator, I'm sorry. Uh, we we uh, we're actually pretty good friends, and and seeing his uh, 
his last couple fights have been saddening to me. I always want guys that have beaten me before uh, to, to, to go higher and higher. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I, I don't know. I thought about, I thought about that when I first got into bare knuckle, bringing, bring, you know, calling one of those guys out, trying to see if we could do a third one there. Uh, I think they're up there. So uh, I don't know, man. I, 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 I don't have a taste for it anymore, to be honest with you. Um, really happy with the way that this one ended. Uh, I think, you know, I'm, I'm uh, uh, being awarded an award at, in Belfast, you know, in, in for uh, the bare knuckle stuff. And uh, I'm just happy with the results right now, man. And, and uh, after really this hat last year and a half of preparing for this last fight, I'm at peace, man. I feel really good about the decision. And really at 41, I mean, the clock's working against me no matter what. So um, I, I just, uh, I heard a lot more. I had to do an ice bath last night. Then I went and sat in the sauna afterwards and uh, I, I felt it, man. I felt all 41 years piling up. And, uh, you know, it's just, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm happy. And uh, I, I like, like, like going out on top is the best way. And I think that's what's going to keep me out. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just that. That's where I'm at now. And uh, I don't know if you've seen my wife, but she's a tough customer, man. And, <laughs> and uh, that, that would be a hell of a fight too. So I don't want to do that either. Yep, I understand where you're coming from. I'm a married man myself. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> when you kind of like, when you look back on this career of yours, is it the first zombie fight that sticks out to you as like the go-to memory? Like, what are like? <laughs> If, if the Leonard Garcia biography comes out, you want to hook him with the first chapter, right? Like what's the first chapter going to be about? Um, you know, I, 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 I would like to, 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 I, I hate thinking about one fight being more important than the other. When, when, when I look back, I want, uh, somebody asked me this question a while back and I sat, sat and thought about it and, 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 and played it out. I would love to have a library of all of them you know, without, without the stories, without the clips, without everything to watch the rise, the fall, the rise, the fall, the rise. Um, and I got lucky because I rose quickly and then I fell and then I rose quickly again. And then I fell and then I rose quickly again. If you watch my career, um, throughout every single, uh, organization that I fought for, I either won the title or competed for it. Every single one. I never fought for an organization and didn't challenge for the belt. Never. Like I always, always reached the the, the highest point of, of of every organization that I work for. So um, I think that's the story. You know, strive to be the best. You know, and 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 that's what I always did. Um, and I always wanted to be the best at at, at anything that I did. And now that I'm doing oil, you know, oil field automation out here in Texas. It's like, I want to be the best at that. And, 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 uh, that's always my goal is to be the best at, at whatever it is that I do and teaching my kids to do that. Now, I think now it's going to be more of a focus on them than myself. I think I've accomplished, uh, several things and, and now to see them grow and, and to see them go out and, and, and tackle their goals and help them along the way, that's that that's my drive now it's a good way to look at it especially with the kids and everything so like outside of striving to be the best i mean that's that that that, that'd be like a great piece of advice to give to anybody but if you could give like this next generation of fighters you know a a very valuable piece of advice a piece of wisdom that you could pass on from you know your years experience in mma bare knuckle the combat sports world in general what would you say to them um train like take take training as seriously as possible but the biggest piece of advice that i can give them and the reasons that i fell so hard is uh don't drink the kool-aid man don't when people start to tell you you're the best when people start to make you feel like you're the best when you're beating everybody up at the gym and you start to think you're the best don't start going out there and showing that because yes, men are the most dangerous people in the gym. Uh, I think when you have coaches, when you have training partners, when you have people all around you that are telling you, Oh man, there's nothing better than you. 
You're going to hit somebody. They're going to crumble. You're going to do this and they're going to fall. You can't lose. When you believe that, you're in for it. And uh, I seen that in my opponent this fight. Um, you know, I, I and, and I remember that guy uh, in 2010 that faced Mike Brown, which was me. I remember, I remember Leonard being that guy. I remember being in the gym and I remember training and they're like, oh man, as soon as you touch Mike, he's gone. Doesn't matter what you hit him with, he's falling. People in the gym were falling all over the place. My coaches were telling me, oh, they were holding pads for me and they'd take the pad off. Like my hand hurts, you're hitting so hard. And I believe that wholeheartedly. Mike Brown went in there and ripped my head off with that right hand. And they told me, you can't be hurt. You you can't be hurt, nothing. I mean, he can hit you with the kitchen sink. He hit me with way more than the kitchen sink that day. And uh, that's, that's, that's the best advice I could tell anybody. Don't ever drink the Kool-Aid, man. Don't ever believe that you're the best because – there is a young man or an old man out there training and busting his butt. And uh, if you run into that guy that's getting ready, you're going to lose. So uh, if I've got the, the, the best advice I could give anybody is prepare yourself like you're nothing every single time. Always look to improve. Never look to be the best. Always look for improvement, man. Keep finding the best way to get better. All right. Well, I'm going to take your advice right now because you said yeah. – you said earlier that if BKFC offered you a position to, to, to do interviews, that'd be something you'd be interested in because you know what fighters like to be asked. You also know what fighters are annoyed to be asked. So yeah. let me ask you, what what kinds of questions annoy fighters? Oh, man. Is this the best preparation? Are you, are, uh, uh, are, are you, uh, you know, is this the most ready that you've ever been or <laughs> – those questions drive you nuts as a fighter, man. You hate, like, what do you want me to say? No, I'm not ready. Like, uh, well, you know, I didn't really train yesterday. Uh, I ate McDonald's today. Like, I mean, you know, ask serious questions, man. Hey, man, you know, how, 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 how are you feeling? We're always going to lie. We're always going to say I feel great, feel fantastic. I had a broken jaw once going into the Takaya fight, and they're like, how do you feel? Oh, I feel great. You know, I feel <laughs> really shocked. Uh, but, you know, fi fighters always lie. They're never going to tell you the truth. They're never going to tell you where their weight's really at. They're never going to tell you how they really feel. So uh, play into that a little bit. You know, always ask them questions, like, with not a definite answer. Are you going to win this fight? Yes or no? Like, of course they think they're going to win, you know? Uh you know, questions like and, and when 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 reporters ask us, what's your game plan or how do you see this fight going? Like, I'm not telling you, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to tell you how I see this fight going because he's listening. You know, as fighters, man, that's all we do. We're searching the Internet. You put a picture with the training partner on there. I'm looking up that training partner. I'm seeing who he is, what he does, why he's there. What does he do that's similar to me? What's he getting you ready for? Um, we study everything, man. And uh, fighters that don't do that don't make it very far. But uh, those, those, those are things, man. Just just uh, not don't don't ask definite answer questions. Ask more roundabout stuff like, man, you know, you looked real good in your last fight. How do you plan on continuing that growth, you know, into this fight? Is that, you know, they're never I mean, we always lie. Like I said, we always we never tell the truth. We always say. Yeah, you know, I did this or I did that. We never tell you. I brought in this world champion to help me get ready. This coach right here has the best insight on this or that. We never say those things we will on our opponents to know. Great stuff right there from Leonard Garcia. Happy trails to him. Good for Leonard. Going out the win. Wish him nothing but the best. But seriously, for, for you new fans out there, do yourself a favor. Go back. I don't know if it's on Fight Pass. It's got to be on Fight Pass. Go back into the archives on Fight Pass. WEC 48, April 2010. The main event for that card was Uriah Favor versus Jose Aldo. 
Go watch that and go watch Leonard Garcia versus the Korean Zombie 1. It is an absolutely ridiculous fight. It is insane. It is one of the craziest fights of all time. There's no doubt about it. Highly recommend you go back and watch it. WEC was great anyways, but that fight kind of exemplified why WEC was so great. Why the UFC needed the lighter weight classes to come on in. And uh, man, that fight was just un freaking believable but go watch you will not be sorry uh but we're gonna wrap things up we got one more interview to get to but first again big thank you to all of you for watching the show checking us out this week once again it's on to year two everybody on to year two for your pal mike and i am looking forward to it rest of the week here is going to be a very very busy one back with the a side live chat tomorrow my best friend ak lee will be in the guest hosting chair so make sure you check that out get your questions in and the reason AK is stepping is because Jose Youngs will be in Las Vegas for UFC 260 Fight Week. And with that, we'll have media day on Wednesday afternoon. We'll have the press conference with Stipe and Francis Ngannou on Thursday. We'll have a live between the links right after that. And everyone's been saying, where's Jed Mishu? Where's Jed Mishu? Jed Mishu back on the program this week. We'll have another number one contenders bout. Opponent TBD for Mr. Mishu. But that's going down. We get the weigh-in show on Friday. We'll have preview show. Then we'll have all of your fight day stuff and coverage, pre-fight show, post-fight interviews, press conference, post-fight show. Just buckle up and strap in. It's going to be a very busy week. We got you covered. And you guys know this by now. Nobody does these fight weeks like we do. And uh, you'll see why throughout this week. But until then, thanks again for checking out the show this week. Big thanks to Casey Lydon on the production. Big thanks to Jose and Cool Alex on the graphics. Have a heck of a week, everybody. We wrap things up this week with UFC flyweight, former Ryzen champ, Manel Cap. All right, let us say hello to UFC flyweight, former Ryzen champion, Manel Cape, coming off his second Octagon appearance, split decision loss to Mateus Nicolau earlier this month, but that's not really the story coming out of that fight. Happy to have the star boy back on the program. Manel, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm very good. It's good to have you back. First things first, you have been in my eyes, Manel Cape for years now. Even like once you signed with the UFC, you've been on the show many times, you were Manel Cape, but since you made your Octagon debut, the broadcast team say it's Manel Cop. Is it Cop or is it Cape? Cop, Cop. It is Cop. A Cop. Yes, All right, cop. now we know. I apologize for that. I've heard it said both ways, but mostly Cape, so I'm glad we got to clear this up. Manel Cap. Mm -hmm. now we got it. Mm -hmm. got to figure it out. So let's discuss your last month, month and a half or so, because it took 14 months to get you in a fight for the UFC. You debuted in February, took on yes. Alexander Pantoja. You lost a unanimous decision. It just, to me in that fight, it looked like you just had a hard time like getting going in there. Like, How would you describe that fight, that performance? What were you feeling in there? Uh, you know, um, uh, I don't have any excuses. You know, I don't make any excuse. And for me, uh, I learn everything, uh, every every fight. Uh, doesn't matter if I win or lose. I lose. I I take like a, a learn. You know, a big a big lesson. Uh, yes, it, it's been a, a a hard time for me. You know, because um, in Japan I was fighting with my 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 boot. Uh, my shoes and uh, fight, fighting without shoes for me is very difficult because the problem what I have in my feet uh, hyperhidrosis because I sweat a lot and uh, and I don't have uh, my stability you know I don't feel too much comfortable but uh, yeah this is what me make me no uh, go forward for for the fight but. It, it, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I've been learned how to fight uh, now in cage. And uh, I think that uh, in my second fight, I show much better in, in improvement. And yeah, that's it. That is. Yeah, I mean, it, c clearly, like not having the shoes on w was a big difference. I mean, feeling the octagon, you're in a cage. So, I mean, just fr from like from like a mental perspective did it did it feel different like actually being in there like being in the apex no people like did, did it just feel different like mentally no uh, you know prob probably probably you know i've been talking with uh, javier mendez he helped me a lot mentally uh 
about uh, not focus in too much negative, not, not focusing too much negative. Like if I have this problem, just focus on on go forward and uh, let the let the fight go. You know, doesn't matter what happened. Uh, for just don't focus on your feet and focus on better strike and um, more combinations and be and show uh, show more my skills. You know. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, especially you coming back about a month later against Nicolau. Yeah. First round, yeah. it was kind of similar to what we saw in the Pantoja fight. But second round, man, you got rolling. You started landing some big shots. You had him in some big trouble. What changed in that second round? Like, was it uh, Javier Mendez speaking to you between rounds? Did he say something to get you going after that first round? Yes, of course. And uh, everybody know that my, my first rounds. Uh, every time is bullshit. I know. Uh, <laughs> I need to. I need the uh, the start of my rounds like more more aggressive. Is like is my style. You know, is my is really my start. I just start uh, feel feel very good uh, on second round. I don't know why, but I need to figure out this. I think is this is mentality. Uh, I have I have a lot of these problems. You know, I think this is mentality. My first round ne- never was good. Never was good. Never in my whole life that I, I fight. My first round never was good. Just my second, uh, third, four and five rounds. I'm very, very, very good, you know. So, mm, you know, but in first round, like uh, he win, he, he, he won the fight, but uh, he's not uh, like so dominate, you know, he even touch, touch too much in my face, just he win because of the taking downs. And in the ground, I was try to work my my jujitsu, my my submission attempts, and um, he was he was very very smart. He see everything on first round, but on second round, I I kill him, I kill him 100%. You know, I smoke him and uh, I, I smash him. I seen his eyes. I saw his soul. You know that he's so afraid on, on second round. I was close to knock out him. Mm. But he he stay he stay very composed. He stay very composed after my my striking attempts of him. And on on third round, on third round, I was thinking I have the, this fight already win. You know, I was have this fight. Everything what he throw, I throw more and uh, more effective. This is not me. This is the numbers, and the numbers don't lie. This is a fact. And uh, I throw more, more, more punch. All punch effectives. I uh, I stop all his uh, takedown attempts, and uh, he, he, everybody saw in last in uh, last seconds I throw the the knees, the big knees that uh, uh, should give me the, this fight. You know, should give me this fight win. But yeah. Were, were, were you surprised that he survived that second round? Because he has been knocked out a couple of times in his career. A, a lot of people thought his chin was, was a little bit questionable. I was surprised. I was very surprised. You know, I was very surprised. Very, very surprised. You know, I throw very hard punch. I was throw very hard punch. I, I still feel my I still feel my fingers my and my hand super painful. Uh, and my, I was surprised. I really was surprised. And... Uh, uh, Mateus, is it, it, it was tough. It was tough. It was tough because I throw very, very hard punch. I feel I open his, I open his eyes. You know, uh, make his face uh, with a lot of blood. You know, I feel the smell of his blood, and uh, I was think like he feel the, the 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 blood. You know, and when somebody feel the blood like animals, they they are scared. You know, they they can't give and do nothing. You know. He feel his blood. I, I saw his eyes, you know, and um, it was very, 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 very tough to survive in second round. Yeah, you mentioned the third round. Uh, UFC stats, you actually outstruck him with significant strikes, 31 to 27 in the round. So when the final horn sounded, I assume you guys were feeling quite confident you had done enough to win the fight. So when the judges read the decision and they award it to him, like what is going through your mind? Ah. Uh. You know, uh, we, 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 I was very, I was very composed and tranquil that, uh, like, 
I get this win. I, I, get, I get this win. And uh, you can see that uh, Nicolau, he was, uh, he was the feeling that somebody that lose the fight. When, fight, when, uh, when the fight finish, uh, he can even uh, uh, stand his hand in the air. His coach scream, hey, Nicolau, stand your hands in the air. You know, this is this is the um, this is when some somebody win the fight. When somebody win the fight, uh, this is the signal of the, the 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 winner. Stand up the hands in the air. This is all all winners. All winners when feel the, the win, uh, they stand his hands in the air. He he can even stand his hand in the air when his coach say, "Hey, Nicolas, stand his your hands in the air." He feel. You know, you feel I have the feeling the winner. You have the feeling of the loser. You know, this is this is the true. This is the true. And uh, when uh, they told the result, like in final, I was, I was surprised. And he he too, he was surprised. He was surprised, you know, and uh, he is his corner man was make a lot of party because they know they know and they he feel, you know. On MMA Decisions, I don't know if you saw this. Like, I know you posted the verdict MMA numbers. Uh, MMA Decisions is a website where, like, media members, they score the fight as they happen. And 100% of them, 22 out of 22, all scored the fight for you. How frustrating is this whole thing for you? Because, you know, who understand MMA? Who, who understand MMA? Of course, they will give me the win, the, the, the fight. Like... Is not my opinion. Is all opinion. Everybody, everybody opinion. He can't fight against this. He can't say like, uh, oh, uh, DC make uh, uh, a commentaries uh, wrong commentaries like because everybody said talk. It's not just DC. It's everybody. You know, it's everybody. When they ask you if you 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 think that you win the fight, he say like, I'm not a judge. This is not my work. Like, you know, you know. Of course, it's frustrating. I feel I, I, I won the fight, but uh, in the end of the day, uh, is the judge the decision, the judge, you know? This is what makes me frustrated because I, I've been working so hard. I know that my performance is not uh, our expectation and everybody expect. I know that I know that I need uh, the, the improve myself for, for better performance like like before, like I did in Japan. I need the 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 show the last the the last manel uh, in Saitama Super Arena. I need I, I know that uh, I, I I need the the be more aggressive, but I did uh, I did the work for me, and I learned in UFC doesn't matter um, doesn't matter if you give a a big performance or if you fight bad. The most important is win, you know, is the win. So this make me a little bit frustrated, you know. My colleague, um, Guillerme Cruz, actually spoke with Mateus last week. And let mm. me just, I just want to pull up this quote. He said, the third round, if you watch it, I beat him for four minutes and he landed two good knees in the end of the round and I took them well. Then I landed a spinning elbow. Watching the third round all five times, it's pretty clear I won. He wasn't landing anything. I was landing in and out, scoring well and hurting him. I kicked his leg and he went down. I landed several punches to the body, many crosses to the head. On top of that, Manel, he feels that the biggest reason people feel you got robbed in the fight was because Daniel Cormier was on commentary, who's obviously over at AK as well. They thought the commentary was biased towards you because Javier was in your corner. So I'm curious, after hearing what Mateus thought about the third round and hearing his comments about DC on the broadcast, what do you make of that? Ho, oh, now, now I, I need to understand. Ho, oh, oh, it's a, he say all these things like the the punch in 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 body, everything. So why why in a third round? Why in a third round? I have more signative uh, signative uh, strikings than him. Why? I know that I know that everybody I know that everybody throw more punch than me, but I have a big difference and throw and touch. 
they throw, but they can touch. They can touch, you know. He don't touch. He throw a lot. You can see my fight against Pantoja. He throw a lot, but you can see the difference. Pant Pantoja throw a lot, but I I throw the signative strikings. You know, this would make people like he like work, make feel like work, but they they don't work. You understood? What should the fight Mayweather? People throw more than him. You understood? Yeah. People throw more than him, but nobody touch him. You know, nobody catch him. This is what MMA should be like the boxing. Okay, they throw, but what's the most important? The the if signative strikings. My my all, all I, I tell you my all strike that I throw, they hurt. You know? All strike that I, that I throw, they hurt. And they feel. I don't feel nothing like you you throw, look my face. I'm good. I'm very I'm very composed. I'm I'm very I'm, I, I finished the fight, the same guy that enters in the ring, you know, you understand? And he know, he know, he feel all my punch. You see, you see his face, his face was, uh, was very ugly, you know, his face was ugly. He, can, he can't even uh, give me this reason that he, he win because he throw, throw. Okay, you throw, but like I defense all this strike. I throw the significant strike. This is my... Uh, this is my 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 sport science is hit and don't get hit you know this is what i'm think hit and don't get hit you know in a rising too i was not throw more than, than than one two but i throw the hardest punch and i knock out people you know so when you talk about dc because dc is a fighter DC is a commenter, but he's a fighter. He has the eyes of the fighter. He can see the fight. It's not just DC. It's everybody on Twitter. When they finish the fight, it's everybody on Twitter that give me the, the winner. He can say the DC. You know what he did? What he did when he said DC? He, he took all attentions. The, the, he, uh, the, 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 the real reason what he saw, he saw that DC make this commentary is for take all attentions on the, the fight. He take the attention of fight and he vit victimizes yourself. Oh, I'm a victim, you know? You know what a victim? You just try to hide, the hide the real conversation is the fight and put all attention on DC for people feel like, okay, Maybe it was he have a reason for say that, and people will feel sorry for him. You understood? He won't feel that people feel sorry because DC. But the real reason what he did is just for hide, you know, the real the real conversation, and he can do this. I'm more smart than him, you know. I'm more smart than him, you understood? I don't know what what mental games he tried to do, but with me this don't work. You know, it don't work. My my IQ is super high for, for, for him. And, and he cannot even have this conversation. You know, he, he can't even this conversation. Because if you are really, if you feel like that you win the fight, when DC asks you, you win the fight, he, 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 he never should say, oh, this is not my work. This is the judge's work. <laughs> you know, I don't make decision. This is what he say. This is what he say. If DC ask me this, if you really win, if I feel that I win, and I, I ask, I, I will answer. 100% that I win. You don't see? I throw, I hurt him a lot, and I make the signature striking. Even that I, I don't count the numbers, but I know that I have the signature strikings. I don't throw for throw, you know? I throw for touch, you know? Forget, for don't get hit and hit. You know, sir? So what you try to do, this is this is, is simple. People can see, you try to hide the, the real conversation and put the attentions on DC because DC is a big name, you know? And DC is my my team, you know? And so people will feel like, okay, influence, you know? But it's not this, you know? It's not this, it's not the real conversation. He cannot do that, you know? Not with me because I pay attention to everything, you know? Yeah, I, I feel like it's kind of like the cool thing to do now to 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 like throw it on DC. I feel like a lot of fighters do that right now. Of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. But but uh, you we need understood. This is a fighter, right? You know, this is a fighter. This is a 
DC have the eyes of the fighter. And all fighters, they give me the, the this fight that I win, you know? So DC have the better eyes that the judges, the judges never fight, you know? You know? But I don't know how they scored the fight, you know? I don't know they, they, how they scored the fight or how long time they, they watched the fight, but it's, it's not first time that everybody... Uh, uh, Everybody complain. Everybody complain about the judges. Not first time. No, last no. time, la last time, last time they did a big difference. Like in a, uh, uh, in a, in the fight of uh, Easy against uh, uh, the Gen. Like uh, fucking big difference. You know. Yeah. How can you say that? Like these guys don't understand about about fight. You know, these guys don't understood about fight. This guy don't understand about the the science of the fight. When somebody may, when somebody ha is a smart fighter inside in in, in uh, inside the ring, and uh, my philosophy is uh, hit and don't get hit, you know. And they they count they score more than people that uh, uh, look that work but don't work. So I will work like that too. I will throw a lot but don't touch. So they can see me that I work. Okay, they give me the 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 the, the, the victory. But this is not the this is not fight, you know. That's not how you do it. You you yeah. like you said, you hit and not get hit. Yeah, because look, my face my face was <laughs> my fa my face was the same face, you know. My face was the same face, and the, all the numbers, all the numbers, and the verdict, they 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 they, they show, you know. I, 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 Manel throw more than him, you know, through the effective uh, strikings, you know. So in your eyes, like you're taking this as a win, like mentally, this is a win for you. You don't count it as a loss like up here. I mean, bank account wise, you don't get the second half of your paycheck, which sucks, obviously. But well, of, of, of course, of course, the money, the money is motivation, too. Sure. You know, the money is motivation, too, you know, and uh, of course, you I win. I know that I win, but they don't get my 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 money. You know, the winner, winner money, and uh, okay. And then my share dog on my share dog, they stay one more lose. You know, it's crazy because I remember. I remember the first time I talked to you and you talked about this like very important moment in your life, in your career is after the Oka Sasaki fight, you like looked at yourself in the mirror and you said to yourself, like, no more, I'm not losing anymore. And if, and even if I win, no more decisions, like we're going to be a world champion, no more decisions or finishing everybody. So after being in two decisions in the UFC, you got two losses on your record. One, obviously everybody thinks you won. Like, have you had to have like another conversation with yourself yeah i need to have this conversation uh, uh, you know i need uh, i need the respect to my body i need to respect my body because i've been training uh, for a while you know for a, for a while uh, all full uh, four camps straight any 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 time to rest you know and uh, i need to respect this i get a lot a lot of injuries too and uh, I, I need to come back more strong. I need to come back more strong. And uh, I think uh, this vacation, this uh, big vacation will will make me feel, uh, you know, uh, make me feel more strong and uh, more composed and uh, very healthy, healthy. This is the most important. Are you staying in California and like no. for the time being or are you back home? No, 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 no. Now I'm living in. Now I'm living in Vegas. I'm living in Vegas. Okay. I will live here. I will live here, and uh, all my um, uh, fight camps are. I will train in California. I will be back in California and training there. Okay, so you're staying in the United States, though. Yes, yes, I'm stay here. Okay. I'm stay. So you say you want to take 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 some time off, heal up. You did a bunch of camps in a row. Like when are you yeah. like when are you thinking about getting back there? Like what makes sense for you to to get back in there and the vacation and get back in there and try to get your first win in the UFC? Give me four months, three or four months. Give me three or four months. I don't know. Let let me let me feel let me feel let me feel good and feel uh, and miss. Of course, I miss all the time the, the the training, the fight. You know. 
just uh, I was super tired of the training, you know. Uh, I'm, I was just go training just for training, you know, not because, oh, you love the training, you need the training, you know. I don't always, I don't always feel this. It's a, a long, a long fight camps that I did, and uh, I was just feel boring, you know. Everybody that training with me, you know, that I just make a, a, a wait seven or eight weeks of the the full camps, then I have a fight and stop. But no, this time I was like feel a lot boring. I don't feel uh, good training, and uh, I need feel miss, you know. I need miss the training. The, the sparring, I need to miss this, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like uh, being in a relationship, you know, when you break up, you know, you, like, you think you'll get back together, and the absence makes the heart grow fonder, right? Of course, of course, it's like a relationship. You give, you give a a, a, a big example, big a big example, because I have this experience too in relationship when and when everybody was together every 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 day, every 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 day. And we was suffocate, you know. We was suffocate. Uh, it, it, it's true. true. It's true. You give me a, a good example because I, I passed for this. I was I was past this. You know, in the beginning the relationship is so fire. It's a fire. It's a lot of emotions. It's a lot of love and everything. And uh, I think the relationship just should be three months and then stop. You know, and come back again, and come back again. You know. These three months is uh, when the love was on fire, you know. It's and then is a lot suffocated. So uh, we need miss. We need miss. We need to stay uh, some 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 weeks far, you know, and feel again the the love and the fire. This is what I I, I need. I need feel for my trainings. Uh, feel the love and fire of training. Come back with a big smile, not uh, sad and uh, boring, you know, because it's not healthy, you know. So everything, like- <laughs> is, everything is about love. Everything is about love. Everything is about 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 love and uh, and feel the, the missing. If you don't feel love, you can you you can give yourself, you know, for relationship or for the training. That's a good point. So yeah. w- w- would you say if if fighting is like a relationship and the sport is like a relationship, is the UFC title like like a wedding ring? Like you found the one, this is it. Like you, you've you've made it. You, you're married. But this is forever and ever, baby. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, one hundred percent. I have to say, there's a. I host a matchmaking show for the website called On to the Next One, and there's a fight everybody has been calling for, Manel, that they want to see. They want to see you and Tyson Nam, man. Both of you have like international appeal. Both of you guys like to stand and bang. You both like to knock people out. C- can we make this one happen after the vacation, Manel? Everybody wants to see it. You would make a lot of people happy if you signed a contract to fight Tyson Nam June, July, whenever you're ready to come back. Yes. That's the one? You like that one? Of course. Of course. Of course. But uh, I, I want to, you know, I want to fight uh, uh, when I come back. I want to fight against uh, Kai Kara. He's a fighter that gives me this motivation. You know, I feel uh, in flyweight division is a uh, is the kind of the the, the fight that I wanna. Uh, I like his style, and I wanna I wanna prove myself who who have the best striking. You know, he knock out people out. Me too. You know, and I wanna see who is the most complete fighter. You know, will be a a big a big fight and an excited fight. That's a good one. Um, Tim Elliott actually uh, would would like to fight you too. Like out of all respect, he thinks you're a great fighter. Uh, was a big fan of you in Japan. Would 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 love love the opportunity to to fight you as well. Of course, of course, Tim Elliott uh, is a is a, a great fighter. You know what he did in in Dimitri Johnson. Not everybody did. You know, I think uh, he was more close. Uh, I don't know, but I always think that he was more close. Uh, to win, to win the fight, it was very close. Uh, the the guillotine attempt sure, was sure. was uh, uh, was very exciting, you know. So, of course, he's, uh, he's I have a couple of fights that make me exciting in the flyweight division, 100. percent And the uh, Timil Elliott is one of one of them. So I just yeah, so I just wanted to kind of get your take on Habib now that he's, you know, officially, officially retired and, uh, you know, the presence he had for your training camp and just being around him. What was that like for you? You know, Khabib is, Khabib is an animal. He's just a different fighter. He's a, 
when he's taking down people, believe me, nobody can move. You know, I saw these guys. These guys from Dagestan, like Islam, and uh, the Khabib brother too, and uh, they, they are, they are different, bro. They are different. Believe me. Just you, you, you need to feel. You cannot say, not have the words for describe uh, the power of what of what these guys have. And Khabib is, believe me, is just a is a is a animal. The guy is is a different fighter. And he's very good. He's very good. To stay close of him. He is uh, very funny and good, give me a good advice. And uh, he motivated very well the team. You know, he's a very smart guy. Where do you put him on like the greatest fighters of all time list? Is he right up there for you? Yeah, one hundred percent. There you go. 100%. Well, one hundred. I would agree with that. He's he's definitely right up there. I think he's one of the most dominant champions of all time, and I don't even think he's as good as he would have been, which is even scary. Yeah. I think he actually could have gotten better. He's, he's, he's a dominate, believe me. He's a dominate fire, you know. He's a dominate fire. He's a bad man, but uh, I, I appreciate the time very much, Manel. It's always great when you and I can catch up, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back in there. Take some time, enjoy it, fall back in love with the game, and uh, we'll see you back in there, man. I appreciate the time. You and Tyson Nam, I think that's the fight to make, but if they do Kai Car France or Tim Elliott or anybody, uh, I'm all in, but I'll get on the horn with Abe and Malky. Make the Tyson Nam fight happen. You'll, a lot of fans will be happy, but thanks again, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're listening to the Vox Media Podcast Network.